We're glad that you're with us today. I want to welcome each and every one of you. Um, today we're going to be in Proverbs. So if you've got your Bibles, grab them, go there, Proverbs chapter 5. We're also going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll start in Proverbs. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, like I said, we're glad to see you all in church. I want to welcome you. Uh, for those that are joining in on our YouTube and through Facebook, glad that you decided to um, also tune in. Today's sermon um, might seem a little strange for a for a church sermon. Um, I might even say it's re rated PG-13, um, but it's biblical. It's in the Bible. We'll see that Um before we start and I get too into it, let's pray. We'll ask the teacher to be here. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for allowing us to come before you. I pray, Lord, that as we go through your word today, that you just open up our hearts to understand. Uh, just move me out of the way. The things that are said, Lord, I pray that they're from you and you just use me as the vessel to deliver them. Any thoughts that I have, Lord, let them come for you from you. And I pray, Lord, you just move me out of the way. Use me. It's you see fit and direct us and lead us in the rest of this service in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be in Proverbs chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Today we are starting um, a love series. This is part one of a love series. And it is the first series that my dad and I have decided to tag team and do it together. Um, one each week on love for the next couple of weeks. And it's the first time we've planned it. Last couple of sermons seem to have been that we planned them together, but didn't even discuss what we were preaching on. It was the Lord planning it. Um, this one we've actually planned, and we're going to be talking about the Bible, the loves that are in the Bible. Um, there's four different types of loves. This is the spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Uh, eros. Philia, Storge, and Agape, those are your four loves that are in the Bible. Um, each one represents a different type of love. And as I said a few weeks back, the English language is very limited in how we have words, I guess is the best way to describe it. Um, we'll say things like love, and then we're translating how the person meant it based on how it was used. Um, for instance, if I said I loved mint and chip ice cream, it's the best ice cream there is, especially the thrifty brand. And if you disagree, then you need to get closer to Jesus. Um, but you know I how I mean love in that scenario. There's four different types of love, as I said. And if I say I love my wife, I love my best friend, I love my parents, and Jesus loves me, you see... Those are four different types of love just in the translation of, you know, that I love my wife in a different way than I love my parents and <clears throat> or my best friend. And so those are the different types of loves that we have in the Bible. And it was written in Greek and they actually have a different word for each types of those loves. Again, we as Americans just say love and use our brains to translate it. When the Greek, Greek New Testament was written, they wanted to make sure that it was not open to translation. This love is the love that I am speaking of when I write this Bible verse. So, led and directed by the Lord. And a spoiler alert, the four loves that I just said with my wife and my friend and my parents and God are the four loves in the Bible. And again, we'll get to that. Today we're going to be learning about the first of those, and it's Pretty appropriate considering that we're a couple of days away from Valentine's Day. Again, not necessarily planned by us, but today we're going to be learning about Eros love. It is spelled E R O S, pronounced Eros, and it is a Greek word for love. And I printed up this thing from the internet. Eros is the Greek word for a sensual or romantic love. The term originated from the mythological Greek god of love, sexual desire, physical attraction, and physical love. Therefore, when eros is used, it is described or expressed as a sexual romantic attraction. 
Eros is also the name of the mythological Greek god of love, sexual desire, physical attraction, and physical love, whose Roman counterpart was Cupid. Love in this form of Eros seeks its own interest and satisfaction to possess the object of love. But within the boundaries of marriage, Eros, love, would be celebrated and enjoyed as a beautiful blessing from God. Proverbs 5, 18 through 19 says, Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice in the life of wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind and the, a pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished in her ways always. So when Eros is used as God intended it and created it in the Garden of Eden, it is a physical, sensual, intimate love shared between husband and wife. The term we have in English of erotic comes from eros. And when we hear this word and this type of love, we probably don't really think of the Bible. And we're going to learn today that it is in the Bible. It is in the Old Testament, even though the Old Testament was not written in Greek, but the Hebrew version of the same love is in the Old Testament entire book, actually, which we're not going to read that whole book, but the word eros is never directly used in the New Testament, which was written in Greek. It's only alluded to or described similar, but there is in the Old Testament, which was not written in Greek, but Hebrew. And so let's start in the Old Testament. We're going to be in Proverbs chapter 5. This is verses 15 through 20. Drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only yours, only yours, and until and not for the strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth as a loving deer and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? Like I said, it's a little steamy for the Bible. <laughs> um, but that is the Eros love that we're learning about today. And Solomon is the author of Proverbs here. And he... As we know, Solomon had a problem with women, is the best way to describe it. And from his youth, when he was wise, he wrote a lot about how you should not go astray from God's law. And then as he gets older, he kind of gets a little cynical and writes Ecclesiastes and how everything is vanity. But the things he writes in Proverbs are when he is First king, first, probably, maybe not even king yet, but directed and underneath the anointing of the Lord. And here he is talking about the Hebrew equivalent to eros, which the Hebrew word is aheb. And it means to have affection for sexually or otherwise. So the term when you look up the love he used there, the translation in the original in Hebrew was that type of love which in the Greek translation is the Eros love. Eros love with God-centered, as Solomon is talking about it here, is love. And the Bible tells us God is love, and with Eros love and God at our center, in a marriage it will thrive, and it is blessed. But from the beginning... The first two, male and female, on earth, Satan perverted what God created. And we will see here that what God made perfect from the beginning, Satan is perverted. And we're going to go even farther into it of uh, where we are today and how perverted this Eros love that God created is in our world. So Eros without God will be a sexual desire that is never filled. It's always wanting more. And as we're about to read, it is the downfall of man. 
So look now at Proverbs chapter 6. This is starting in verse number 20. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Find them continually upon your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you roam, they will lead you. When you sleep, they will keep you. And when you awake, they will speak with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law a light. Reproofs of instructions are the way of life. To keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a seductress, do not lust after her beauty in your heart, no, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Here Solomon is giving a warning about that eros love or heb, eheb, then it will destroy a man if it is not within the boundaries of God's law and how God laid it out. It will be destruction. And he shows that because if you look again at verses 20 to 23, he is saying, keep your father's commandments. Don't forsake the law. Write them on your heart. Carry you with them always that while you're sleeping. While, he's saying, do this because it will prevent you from doing this. And we have a problem in the church, not necessarily this church, but in the church with wanting to ignore God's law and not wanting to tell people what God's law says because we're worried of offending. And unfortunately, what goes on outside in the world that people that do not care about God's law can't do anything about them. You can tell them what it says, but they don't care. The problem is when somebody's standing up here behind a pulpit in a church and refuses to talk about what God says is right and what God says is wrong because he doesn't want to offend the people that are in his church, he is leading them just as Satan does down the wrong path by twisting the word of God. And we have a big problem with that in the church today. And if you see here, if we keep God's commandment, he gives us a way of escape. And whenever there is sin in our lives, God gives us a way of escape. When there is temptation, he says he will give you a way of escape. The problem is we don't care about the temptation or we don't know the law because the preachers aren't up preaching the law. And we need to make sure that we are paying attention to what the Bible says. So when you're listening to a preacher, me included, if I'm not saying what it is in here, get up and leave. Go find a church that is preaching what is in here. Because if you're in a church just preaching the feel good and not what's in the Bible, and you don't read your Bible, you do not know that. And there are a bunch of churches that are preaching the word of God that are not afraid to say the Bible says that are not afraid to say this is the word of God that are not afraid to say this is unchanging. It doesn't change with what culture. This is God yesterday, today, forever the same how he wants it, how he created it. There are churches saying that that a lot of people don't go to because it doesn't feel good. And it doesn't feel good because. When your conscience pricks on you, it shouldn't feel good. Let's jump to chapter 7 now, starting in verse number 6. Once again, Solomon. For at the window of my house, I looked through my lattice and saw and among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding, passing along the street near her corner. And he took the path to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And there was a woman and there a woman met him with the attire of a harlot and a crafty heart. She was loud and rebellious. Her feet would not stay at home. At times she was outside, at times in the open square, lurking at every corner. 
So she caught him and kissed him. With an impudent face, she said to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows, so I came out to meet you, diligently to seek your face, and I have found you. I have spread my bed with tap tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love, for my husband is not at home. He has gone away on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will not come home and will come home on the appointed day. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Immediately he went with her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Till an arrow struck his liver as a bird hastens to the snare, he did not know it would cost him his life. Now, therefore, listen to me, my children. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths, for she has cast down many wounded, and all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is always is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Once again, Solomon is warning of a godless love that men have towards women, and lust, not love. That is how Satan has perverted it. And as the world sees it, it's love. No, but he loves her. And it does not matter how the world defines things. It matters how the Bible defines things. Jump with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Men tend to have this issue more than women, or used to. Anyway, men tend to have the wandering eye, if you want to call that, more than women did, which is why Solomon was writing about, be careful, men, don't do this. But it applies both ways to both genders, to the only two genders that there are. And we need to make sure that we know the difference between lust and love true love and what Satan has perverted. And we will see here and dive into that in a little bit, but let's start with 1 Corinthians. This is chapter 7, 1 through 9. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He's talking about sexually right there. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man has it, have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except for consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not a command. I'm going to stop right there. When I was getting ready to do this and study this and get this together, out of many times reading those verses, this is the first time I noticed that Paul is saying, this is my opinion. Everything you just saw, everything I just said, everything I just wrote, that's a command. That's in the Bible. This now is my opinion. So this part is Paul's opinion. For I wish that all men were even as myself, but each one has his own gift from God. No one, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul's opinion is don't get married. If you can handle it, don't get married. The Catholic Church has taken that as a perfect, like, this is how it's supposed to be, and that's why priests and nuns do not get married, because, well, Paul said we shouldn't get married. No, Paul's opinion was not biblical, Paul's opinion, because biblical, God said, it is not good for man to be alone from the beginning. In here, Paul is saying it's not good to get married if you can help yourself, if you can control yourself sexually, then you shouldn't get married. 
because you can devote more time to God instead of devoting time to your spouse. Any husband, I'll try not to look at my wife as I say this, any husband who has been married would have at least an extra half an hour every single day of their life if they did not have to discuss with their wife what they should eat. That's my opinion. It's not biblical. But they would have at least a half an hour every day. Extra. Because a man goes, I'm hungry. I'm going here. And every husband laughed because they know that's a fact. It would ha I would have an extra half hour. Paul later does not talk exactly about that, but he's referencing you're going to have less heartache if you don't get married. But if you cannot help yourself sexually, it is better to get married than to burn with passion or lust and not be able to control yourself and allow Satan to tempt you. But with temptation, there is a way of escape. I am getting to all of this. And I have been saying husband, wife and husband, wife and husband, wife and husband, wife. Because it is Valentine's Day and because we were talking about Eros love. But now we're going to talk about what the other churches do not like to talk about. And if Paul is talking, saying, don't get married, if you can help it, devote your time to God. But if you're going to burn with passion and lust so that Satan doesn't tempt you, find yourself a wife, find yourself a husband. Because... If you just burn with passion and you have lust and you cannot control it, it is a sin. But what churches don't want to talk about is husband, wife, husband, wife, husband, wife. You better make sure you get married. Don't ever have between a husband and a wife. And are leaving out the. By the way, in the same chapters, male and male, also a sin. Oh, we don't want to say that. We don't want to say that because the culture today does not change the word of God. Does not change what he made from the beginning, male and female. That a husband and wife, that Jesus said, become one flesh, male and female, and everybody wants to say, well, did Jesus preach about Because I followed what Jesus said. And, oh, if God's made them, and you know what? I'll step out on a limb. Sure, you're born gay. I don't believe it. But let's just say that scientifically they have proven, which they have not, that you are born gay. If the word of God is saying that when a man lies with a man as he does with a woman, that is an abomination and a sin and will not inherit the kingdom of God. Guess what Paul said? You don't have to get married. You don't have to have sex. So even if you're born gay, you have a way of escape. Don't do it. Don't do it. But we don't want to talk about that as churches because we might offend somebody and we might get emails. Or we might have people not show up to our churches. Paul is referring to this Eros love here and that it is fine within the boundaries of a marriage. I have a footnote in my Bible that talks about this Eros love and sex. And it says sexual intercourse is an intimate expression of affection between a husband and a wife. The apostle underscores its importance in marriage by clarifying that it is, in, that it is in fact a duty. A husband is to be available to his wife at her request and a wife for her husband at his request. It is more than an act of biological mating. The Bible calls it a privilege, a mystery by which two people, a man and a woman, become one. That's Ephesians 5.32 and in Genesis 2.24. The privilege is abused when people not married to each other have intercourse. That is in 1 Corinthians 5.1 and 6.16. Then that which God meant for a blessing becomes a cause of judgment. 
Marriage is the one and the only place that God has provided for sexual union to take place. In that setting, it becomes a powerful symbol of the love between Christ and the church, a pure sharing of joy and a delight in one another that is a gift from the hand of God. Outside those boundaries, it eventually becomes destruction. That is how God intended it. And that is how God created it. And that is how God will bless it. And God defines marriage, not a state, not a culture, not the world. Marriage comes from God in the Bible. And he said, male and female. The world does not get to come and say, well, we voted on it. And marriage is between man and man and woman and woman just as well, because that's not how it was defined. The author of marriage said, this is marriage, male and female. So anybody who's up there preaching, it's OK now because marriage between the same sex is now marriage. So now they're not burning with passion and it's perfectly OK and it's perfectly acceptable is leading people astray and probably worse because if you truly love somebody you'll tell them what you're doing is wrong what you're doing will cause you pain what you're doing is going to be destructive but if you don't love somebody you don't care what happens to them so the preachers that are up there that are saying it's okay go ahead you be you god still loves you true but he does not love what you're doing and they're afraid to say that are worse than what everybody else says of, you're a judge, you're a bigot, you're a homophobe, you're a transphobe. Because they're not saying anything, allowing these people to continue to go down the path that, as the Bible says, when it's a man doing it with a woman who's not his wife, is just as bad as a man doing it with a man or a woman doing it with a woman, it leads to destruction. And I started, and the Lord led me to start with Male and female, male and female, male and female, so that when you got to this part in the video, or if you're sitting here, you understand, I'm not picking on one. Yeah. I am not picking on just, oh, look, he's going to homo bash. He's going to trans bash. I'm not doing that. I'm going to sin bash. And sin is when it is outside God's boundaries. And God made them male and female from the beginning. The Eros love that we're talking about is a gift from God. When it is true and when it is from God, when it is not, it will bring judgment and it will bring destruction. First John 4, 8 tells us God is love. God is love. This is a different type of love. This is agape love. We will get to that in a few weeks. I don't want to even touch on it any more than that. But God is love. And a simple statement that the world makes that are on shirts that are on bumper stickers that I've seen over and over is love is love. It's not God is love. And a simple statement when you hear it of love is love immediately. If you know your word of God should be where well, you took God out of that love, which means it's anti God. And that is how the devil skews things just off track where people go, it's a simple statement. God is love. So what? Love is love. And that is how he leads Satan people off the track. John also wrote in 1 John 4, 5, they are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world and the world hears them. When the world comes up with a term of love is love and you speak, Love is love. You are speaking of the world. The world hears you. And guess what the Bible also says? I am at enmity with the world. And we should be too. And we can see here how Satan has twisted and changed what God made. And it seems harmless when it's just a statement, but it's destruction. And Paul warns us about it in 1 Corinthians. This is 6. 9 and 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. This is where people like to look 
and go, yeah, of course that's a sin, and leave some of these out. God is, will, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Before everybody gets upset, I want to know the next verse. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. If one of those things, and everybody wants to go, oh, look at that, Pastor Bill's up there bashing homosexuality. He got, this, he got the, the clubbing verse about, oh, look at the, how bad the, hom the homosexuals are. Um, I also included idolatry, adultery, thieves, drunkards, covetous. All of them are in the same. And you cannot say, well, yeah. Of course God's not going to let a thief get into heaven, but ignore all the others in that verse. You can't say that unless you're picking and choosing. You either believe all of it or you believe none of it. And the best part is if you believe all of it and you know the next verse, and such were some of you, I was too. Whether you want to admit it or not, you were too. We all were something in those verses. And we are sanctified by the blood of Jesus. So for anyone out there that wants to say, I'm bashing, I'm not. If you are gay, we welcome you in this church. Come on in. But don't expect me to change my sermons because you're sitting here. If you're a drunkard or a thief, we welcome you. The only way the world can be saved is to hear the message of the gospel. And if churches are kicking out the homosexuals, or the drunkards, or the thieves, or the covenants, or the adulterers, if they're kicking them out because we don't want your sin in our church, you're denying them to hear the gospel. Jesus didn't kick them out, but he also didn't say, it's okay, keep sinning how you are because I love everybody, as the world wants to make it sound like he says. He said, your sins are forgiven, now go and sin no more. If you continue in it, then you're not saved. Because Jesus also says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And his commandment is all of that. I don't want you to steal. I don't want you to be covetous. I don't want you to lie. I don't want you to sleep around, whether it be man and man, woman and woman, male and female. He designed it perfect from the beginning. He wants us to stay within the context of his law. And if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And that's the problem that people are afraid to say in the church. Because in today's day and age, I am now a homophobe and a transphobe and all the other things. Because of what I'm preaching is in the word of God. And preachers are afraid to preach what is in the word of God because I don't want to offend. And I don't want to offend either him. If I have to offend you to not offend him, get ready. I'll slap everybody. I don't care. Because I would rather be slapping my own friends and family and the people in this church and the people watching and get into heaven than make sure all of you heard the sunshines, rainbows, and lollipops, and then got there and he said, you were required when you got behind that pulpit to preach what I want you to preach, what my word says. I know that, so I'm going to preach what this word says. And I did not plan on, when I was saying, let's do a love series, getting up here and going, you're all sinners. <laughs> that wasn't my plan. My plan was to get up here and go, let's talk about the love and the different loves in the Bible. And this is the one that I got first. And this is where the Lord led me. Because he wants to make sure you're not destroyed. He wants to make sure that he doesn't have to judge you. He wants to make sure that as it says here, 
You were this, but now you're sanctified through the Lord Jesus. That's what he wants. And like I said, it's easy to point a finger at a certain group of people because that's what it seems like I'm talking about. But if we're honest with ourselves, we were those people too. Have you ever stolen anything? It's in that group. Have you ever gotten drunk? It's in that group. Have you ever been covetous? You wanted just a little more. It's in that group. We all have fallen in that group, in that category at one point. So when we're, they say, you're pointing the finger or you're judging, no, I'm letting you know that you can change. And that with temptation, there is a way of escape. You don't have to do it. I will say this. Everybody's probably going to think, oh, man, I can't believe. No, anybody knows me. No. I have been mad enough in my life before at certain people that I have wanted to knock their teeth in. Guess what? I didn't. You know why? Because we don't have to indulge every feeling we have. I have seen something before and went, oh, man, I really want that. And didn't just steal it. Because we don't have to indulge every feeling we have. And if we can not indulge those feelings, then what's with the other one? Well, that one's okay. Behind closed doors. It's not. It's not. We're washed. We're forgiven. We're not the same person anymore. But if we continue in that sin, we're not allowing Jesus to change us. And we are not showing that we love him because we are not keeping his commandments. Yeah. One more verse from today. This is from Hebrews. This is chapter 13, 4. And this is where you might get a little smack, as I said, from me. But this is where God led this sermon, sermon of love. And again, because I love you, I've got to tell you what the Bible says. This is Hebrews chapter 13, 4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers God will judge. That seems like a pretty simple, easy verse. Unless you tear it down and look at what it means, how it was written in the Greek. And the first part of it, is the eros love, the sexual, the romantic, the butterflies, the fireworks, the love, the passion, the erotic, all, everything that falls underneath that eros love is perfectly fine in a marriage. It says here, it's honorable and the bed is undefiled in a marriage. If you're doing any of that stuff outside of marriage, then guess what? You will be judged. And everybody loves to throw the verses. Again, this is going to happen. It's going to be a sermon one day about misquoted Bible verses. Well, the Bible says judge not. I don't want to get too hard into that sermon because I know it's coming. If I'm in a car with my dad and he's driving and I go, you know you're going 70 miles an hour? Speed limit 65? Am I judging him or am I telling him what the law is? The police officer that pulls him over and writes him a ticket, is he judging him or is he citating the law and giving him a citation for it? When he goes to court, the person behind the bench who says, guilty, pay the fine, is the judge. And if I'm up here saying, the Bible says, I'm not judging, I'm telling you what the Bible says. I'm giving you the warning of what the Bible says. And people like to go, that's judging. No, God will judge. At this point, at the worst, I'm the police officer going, you're going to get a ticket. But if you take it to Jesus, he'll tear it up. But they like to call that judging. And if you tear this verse down from the English, it's honorable. It's undefiled. What you do between a husband and wife is lovely. It's the way God created it. It's the fireworks. It's all the things that everybody is so happy about and the good parts of a marriage. 
Um, but that's because God is love. And when you do it with love is love, then you are underneath the category of, but fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And the love is love, eros, that the world has will bring God's judgment. And the Greek word for fornicator used in this Bible verse breaks down exactly who is a fornicator. And again, this might sting to hear. The Greek word for fornicator is pornos. Is pornos where we get our term pornography or porno. It is the Greek word for fornicator. So you know who falls under the category of fornicator. People who indulge and watch porn. A fornicator, the pornos fornicator, is also an adulterer, incest, acts the harlot, indulges in unlawful lust, either with the same sex or opposite sex, a whore, a male prostitute, a debauchee, a libertine, a whoremonger, or a homosexual. That is what falls underneath the category of the Greek word used in here for fornicator. And if any of them apply to you, guess what? God will judge. Amen. And I looked up two words because I knew debauchery, but I didn't know what debauchery was. And is a person who gives excessive indulgence in sexual pleasures. And as I said at the beginning, eros, worldly love, as described by the Greek god that the term is named after, is unfulfilling, and you're going to want it more and more and more women and more women and more women that Solomon was describing at the beginning. You're going to want it more and more and more. That falls under the fornication. A libertine is a person, especially a man, who behaves without moral principles or a sense of responsibility, especially in sexual matters. These all fall under the term for fornicator that was used in the New Testament, and God will judge. In closing, I want to say our first love in this series can be beautiful, can be a gift from God, because it is from God. Who created it? Or it can be the twisted, skewed, perverted, and sinful thing that Satan and the world call love. The choice is how you choose to love. And the Bible also says, if you say you have love and not God in you, you don't. Because God is love. Not love is love. God is love. And when we invite God into our relationships, when we follow his law, when we repent, when we turn from our wicked ways, he will change us, he will cleanse us, and he will make our love his love, which is a beautiful love that can be filled as opposed to the worldly, twisted, satanic thing that the world is calling love. God is love. It's not love is love. Because only God is the true love. He created it. He defines it. Not us. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you once again for allowing us to come before you. I pray, Lord, that you just pour your love out on us. Help us to get into your word, closer to you daily, so that you can turn all these relationships we have, whether it be with husband and wife in a marriage, or with friends, or with family, or with you, to a stronger love that you have created. As we go through this series, Lord, I pray that you just open up our hearts and our ears to understand it. And that as we go from this place, you remind us through this week that you are love. And you want to love us. 
And we should want to love you because you've given so much for us, your son, dying so that we can be forgiven and that we show we love you by keeping your commandments. I ask, Lord, you watch over and protect us this week. Bring us back at the time appointed by the Father, and we'll give you the praise for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for being here today.